Hi everyone, welcome to Arthritis at Home. I'm Maya and I'm the program coordinator at Arthritis Consumer Experts. I am very excited to be welcoming back the lovely Christina Montoya to our program today, this time to speak about her own disease journey and her experiences living with Sjogren's syndrome as well as rheumatoid arthritis. Christina is a registered dietitian and a Colombian mama living in the land of maple syrup, beavers, and hockey. Christina is a member in good standing with the College of Dietitians of Ontario, Dietitians of Canada, and the Arthritis Health Professions Association. As a patient advocate living with rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome, Christina participates in the Durham Region Sjogren's Syndrome Support Group from the Surgeon Sjogren's Syndrome Society of Canada, as well as the online consumer panel from the Arthritis Society. Thank you so much for being on our program today, Christina. Oh, thank you, Maya, for having me back. It's uh, great to be here. Well, it's our pleasure. So um, I'm wondering if you can start by telling us about when you were diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome as well as rheumatoid arthritis. Well, I'm now 38 years old. 39? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I was diagnosed and when I was 21 with rheumatoid arthritis, and it was a very rapid uh, onset. The symptoms just, it was like within two months, everybody knew I had rheumatoid arthritis. It was really, really quick. Um, however, it wasn't the same with the Sjogren's syndrome. I was diagnosed at the same time with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but I actually had the symptoms since I was eight years old, but uh, no one could figure out what I had. And so um, I, was, I was actually really glad to see um, in the Sjogren's Foundation that they have a new chapter for pediatric Sjogren's uh, because um, the Sjogren's, how it presents in children is very different how, how it is with adults. And so, so that's how my journey began. I mean, my journey really began at eight uh, with a lot of appointments in a small town back home in Colombia, not a lot of resources really, but my mom tried her best. But I have to say that with the rheumatoid arthritis, again, when it hits you, it's like almost, you feel like it's almost like a death sentence, especially when you're so young and you feel like that's the end of it. Like, what am I gonna do with my life? Why me? Uh, now I'm going to work to pay for that medications. I'm working for my pharmaceutical companies. I remember screaming to my mom, dad, and then, what? Why did I study? <laughs> So it was, it was, it was hard, but for some reason, you always kind of keep pushing. Like I, I finished my career as a nutritionist in Colombia and it was, it was very traumatic. It was very painful, but there was something in my brain that I said, I had to keep going. I can't, I couldn't give up. I could not give up. And so I, I kept going, kept going. And when I came to Canada, I, again, I obtained my registration as a dietitian. And it was, again, very painful because of the changes in um, the weather, the culture, language. So everything was crazy. Uh, but fortunately, I have to say that being in Canada did allow me to have more access, access to more treatments than I had in Colombia. So for the case of rheumatoid arthritis, I was kind of blessed that there were treatments that I could choose from. Uh, that wasn't the case for Sjogren's syndrome. So and for those who don't know what Sjogren's syndrome is, <laughs> really, it's also not an autoimmune rheumatic disease. And it's a system, systemic disease that mainly affects the moisture uh, producing glands. And so it's usually, it affects your eyes, your mouth. Um, and everything else that produces moisture. And uh, so because of that, the hallmark of their symptoms are dry eye and dry mouth, like severe dry eye, dry mouth. The problem with Sjogren's syndrome is because it copies, it's similar, the symptoms are similar to so many other autoimmune diseases. So it seems that uh, it overlaps some symptoms from lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, scleroderma. So there's so many that they said, okay, it's, I don't know what it is. So it's, it's so hard to diagnose. But once you're diagnosed, okay, you get a name, but you don't get like a actual treatment. It's all symptomatic. And so that's the frustration with Sjogren's syndrome. And when I came to Canada, then I experienced that Sjogren's syndrome was way more than uh, dry eyes and dry mouth. 
I presented a lot of digestive issues, a lot of food sensitivities. Also, um, my lungs were affected when I first came to Canada. Um, also, like uh, a lot of skin issues, as very skin, uh, dry skin, uh, difficulty swallowing, and the dryness completely deteriorated my eyes. And that's why my glasses had like a light tint. Can you see it? Because they're like very sensitive to the light. And all the treatments are pretty costly when it comes because everything is over the counter, nothing is covered by insurance. So Christina, I'm not sure if um, if you would know the information in regards to this question, but uh, the treatment that you take for rheumatoid arthritis, does it cross over with Sjogren's syndrome treatment at all? Like, is there anything that also helps Sjogren um, or anything like that? Sometimes there are certain treatments that are like overlap. Like um, when, you, um, when you use Plaquenil, it's, that's one of the treatments that they use. Uh, very, some treatments are very similar to what they use for lupus because they said that Sjogren's syndrome is like the lupus cousin. Mm -hmm. So there was like a lot of the um, antibodies, like markers are very similar to lupus, but they're, they're not, they're just cousins. Some of the biologics, um, I will say that uh, the, what I get for my treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, it does help with the fatigue a, a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's the one that they should recommend for Sjogren's, but I guess it does help to re to reduce the inflammation and therefore some of the joint pain and fatigue and muscle pain. So, so it could help, but there just are other things that it, it can't manage, like the dry eye. There's really no treatment to, to manage the dry eyes unless everything is kind of topical. I went to see a very, very nice doctor in Ajax, and I have to say it's a, a dry eye specialist. Dr. Shaw, and so he was very, he does a very thorough uh, evaluation of your eyes. And so he suggested some anti-inflammatory type of uh, eye drops. And also what you call this serum, autologous serum eye drops. So what that means is that they draw your blood and they make your uh, eye drops out of your own blood. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> something. so I heard about that many, many years ago, but because it's, it takes a lot of time, the, the processing, and it was kind of hard to find a place, but they told me there's one pharmacy here in Oshawa, where I live in, in Ontario, and the doctor so doctor Shaw said, just give it a try and see what it is, because ultimately, you're not taking any eye drops over the counter, like, even though you use, like, preservative free, that's what you, you should do because you're using, you're using it like every couple of hours. But then these drops really don't have any side effects because it's your, own, it's your own blood. And what the theory is that because all the nutrients you're absorbing, so then it helps to reduce inflammation. And I have to say that I've been using it for maybe a month and it really made a difference, a huge difference. And again, that's another treatment that's not covered by all hip or by any private insurance. So it's all out of, out of pocket. So it sounds like there are some, you know, potentially experimental treatments in the work, but in comparison to other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, it's lagging way behind in treatment, in research, and um, obviously in coverage also of the things that actually help public reimbursement for the drugs that are used. Yeah, you're right. And, and also you count about all the dental work because of the lack of saliva, the quality of saliva. Uh, it also, uh, it, there's a lot of risk of cavities, uh, oral like infections and deterioration of the teeth. It's, it's unreal. Like uh, you honestly feel like your teeth, your enamel, like it just kind of eats it away because there's no saliva to protect and to kind of wash out all the bacteria that you normally kind of you you normally the saliva production usually does that that's the protection of the saliva and it also helps you to swallow so those are really it really affects your quality of life you might think oh that's nothing as if it is you're not able to enjoy foods you're you're constantly maybe you're not able to smile because you're maybe ashamed to have your teeth look like I experienced that I had to do like a heavy hefty dental work last year and it was almost like $2,000, wow. right? So those are the things that I wish 
there is like more advocacy understanding that that's what we're going through and having that financial kind of strain will think uh, do I do a dental work or do I pay for my daycare for my boy you know well thank you so much for sharing that with us because it's really important for viewers to to have that understanding of these different elements of Sjogren's syndrome not only then does that help other folks with Sjogren's syndrome feel less alone in their experiences, but it also helps to spread awareness, right? Like you said, that this is actually what you're experiencing with the disease and with all of these challenges that, that you experience. Um, what have you found as helpful strategies to manage your symptoms? Well, like I said, like a lot of over the counter, but I finally realized that this is not going away, right? The dryness is with me and it's uncomfortable, it's annoying, but it's there. So I just have to find ways to manage. So um, like I said, a lot of the things is protecting my eyes. It's very important. So making sure that I actually have to wear um, glasses or lenses that have a light tint. So mm -hmm. because you become very like photosensitive because there's no tears to protect your eyes. Um, also, uh, there is another company called like Zena Eye Dry. Yeah, dry, dry eyes, my eye drive. Oh my goodness, this is my Spanish. <laughs> the dry eyes, and they have that really nice, like um, kind of like a goggles. Hmm. So it helps you to to protect your eyes from from air, like when you go for a walk. And so that that dry air, like the cold air, it really dries out your your eyes. Um, like to say like the eye drops are very helpful like every two hours and like my eye my ophthalmologist said it's like a it's like a, your eyeball is like a sponge right so if you only use eye drops every six hours or so it's not going to fill it's not going to get moist so that's why you need to do it like every two hours and why is that important because if you don't protect your eyes i have experienced flare-ups from my from my inflammation in my eyes that is spread like uh, overall, like I had joint pain, muscle pain, and it starts in my eyes. Wow. So one, so a flare up of one of the, uh, one of the diseases, Sjogren's syndrome can then ultimately impact your rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. It sounds like. Exactly. Cause it's just, that is stressor there. That is, uh, so if I don't take care of that stressor, then it, I know that's the consequence. So it might, it might seem like, oh, but it's your eyes. And I said, oh my goodness, it's in my eyes. <laughs> and my eyes can actually trigger a major flare up. And also my, my mouth, that's another thing. Like uh, we have to, cause there's no, our mouth becomes very acid. So it welcomes a lot of bacteria. And we usually get the cavities at the gum line. It's very different from other people. So it's important to keep that pH a little bit higher. So a little bit of like um, um, washing your mouth with um, baking soda and water that really helps it before and after eating. It helps to kind of increase that pH and minimize the discomfort also from the dry mouth and also less cavities. So, so those are like kind of very, <laughs> very, very simple, but it, it actually really helps. And it's just embedded in my routine. So it's, that kind of goes above and beyond of what, what I do for keeping rheumatoid arthritis. And just like everything else, so like a little bit like movement as tolerated, some days are better than others. And also um, like, uh, like, like nutrition to me has been very important because of Sjogren's, I had developed a lot of food sensitivities, sensitivities to gluten, to dairy, and, uh, and that is real, you know, it's not in their people's head. It's like, oh, people tell me, oh, I have Sjogren's and I don't tolerate gluten. And people say, oh, that's a fat diet. But actually there are, uh, that's, that's one of the, the symptoms. A lot of people with Sjogren's develop like a irritable bowel syndrome mm -hmm. or develop digestive, digestive symptoms. And again, it's all linked to the lack of lubrication. Right. And um, just on that point then of living with autoimmune disease in general, or really any chronic disease, we were having a conversation just before we started recording our call about learning um, how to take a break when you need a break and sort of pace yourself. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a bit in terms of managing your diseases. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was just at the end of last year when I had like almost like a mental health like breakdown and it was just too much, right? I committed to too many tasks. And I think we tend to do that when we're feeling well, we think that we can conquer the world and then we can overcommit it. And I think that's something that we really need to pace ourselves to 
to think of what it, we can do, even in a, in, a, in a good day, we should kind of schedule only like a, we, we're capable, capable of doing like 80% of what we think we can do, mm -hmm. right? So, so we can really place ourselves, prioritize what is really important to you. And so to me, taking that mental health break was so important. Like I, I felt that I, it allowed my medication to work better. It allowed me to have like more self-care and not just watching Netflix, but <laughs> but really doing things that I enjoyed. And some of the things are like like blogging or connecting with others and obviously spending more time with my boy. So this year, my goal was to, I need to set up a routine because sometimes we tend to, because we're fatigued, we're like, oh, I do when, when I can do it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. But I think setting up like a, maybe a flexible routine in the day, uh, it really helps, you know, getting up in the morning and not look at your phone right away. Just do some sort of meditation, um, read a book, read something maybe motivational, something that is going to get you going or some movement, but don't look at the phone, maybe for about an hour, just leave it alone. <laughs> So don't get overwhelmed. So make sure that you're concentrating, you're focusing on your meal and your breakfast, even if it's a cup of coffee that you're enjoying, just kind of concentrate on that and set up that routine. Go for a walk, even if it's just for 10, 15 minutes. And I think, like I said to you, having a, a, a boy and he's so active, I need to somehow keep up with him. <laughs> and uh, so for me, my routine is that at around 12, I take him for a walk, he comes home, we eat lunch. And then after that, he has uh, a nap and I take a nap with him for about 20 minutes. And so I think uh, we can adjust our lifestyle according to what it surrounds us. Um, but, uh, but I think just really be aware of what you can do. Like, don't feel guilty. Like, you know, work is gonna be there the next day. Right, so I think it's it's important to just to recognize what you can do because you know the world is there. It's, it's so fast. It's so easy to just keep yourself busy. You need to be productive. You need to be busy. But that's not the case. Your health yeah. comes first. <laughs> Thank you. Those are all such important messages, and um, especially during COVID, I think when a lot of us feel like there is blurred lines between our work life and our personal life, and it can become more difficult to uh, manage our diseases. So on that same note, then um, I'm wondering if you could share what you have learned from your disease journey, and if there are any other pearls that you'd like to share with our patient audience. Oh, I learned to forget myself and not to be so hard on myself, right? And, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> I still feel that why didn't I do that uh, many years ago but you know what when the time is right the time is right I learned that I was able to be a mom despite uh, Sjogren syndrome and and I had a healthy boy and there was a lot of risk when I was pregnant but I think uh, it's important to let the mamas know or, or those women who want to to have babies you know that it's possible uh, but with the right guidance and I think that's something that we need more actually more guidance and, and more support for women with, um, with chronic pain and disabilities. I, I've learned to, to really listen to my body and every, every aspect, like emotionally, uh, uh, socially, right, physically, and having like meaningful conversations with my, my social network or my, my husband because sometimes um, you don't have to be alone. Maybe you make yourself to feel alone, but maybe there's someone else willing to listen in to you, right? And that kind of, kind of lessen the, the burden of being, living with this, these diseases all by yourself. Ask for help, you know? <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing. I was very, no, no, I can do it, Mrs. Independent. And honestly, there's nothing wrong for asking for help. And uh, if someone wants, is willing to give you something for your birthday, then this, maybe skip the box of chocolate, ask them to give you maybe an hour of cleaning, <laughs> right? And support you, send someone over to your house and help them with cleaning. Or maybe um, when we are able to, to look after your kids for a couple of hours so you can rest. So I think asking for help, that was my biggest learning <laughs> that I, you know, it's okay. 
Right. Thank you, Christina. Those are so many beautiful pearls. I know that I am going to try and uh, practice those in my own life. So thank you for that. And um, we also want to let our viewers know that we're going to link some uh, resources. So uh, Shogun Society of Canada will provide a link to their website. Christina um, uh, participates in their support group. And then also Christina's own blog where she talks about her disease journey and provides great great tips for um, eating well and living well with arthritis. Um, and as well as our past interviews with Christina, we've done two other ones before this. She provided some wonderful, wonderful advice. Um, so thank you, Christina, so much for speaking to me today. And as always, it is a pleasure <laughs> to talk with you. And uh, to our viewers, thank you for tuning in, um, for taking the time to learn about uh, this important disease, Sjogren's syndrome, as well as rheumatoid arthritis, if you don't live with it yourself, or taking the time to connect to somebody else who is experiencing it if you are also living it, living with it yourself. Um, thank you so much, and we will see you next week for our next Arthritis at Home episode. Thank you, Christina. Thank you so much, Maya. <laughs>